Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Women in IoT workshop. And I will share a slide and then allow uh, our Dean of Engineering to open our session officially. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Women in IoT workshop held by the Warren B. Nelms Institute for the Connected World. We uh, welcome you to this workshop. We welcome you online virtually. If you're watching us later by YouTube, we welcome you as well. We are celebrating our second annual event to showcase women in the forefront of the area of Internet of Things. Specifically, our theme this year is AI on the Edge. So we're looking forward to hearing from speakers and panelists who are leaders in this, in this research area. To open up our workshop, we have asked the Dean of our College of Engineering, uh, Cami Abernathy, to give us a few comments about what's happening at UF and AI and OT IoT. Um, she might mention that we are ranked as number five in public universities this year. That's a little thing that came out in the listing, um, but we are proud of what's going on here in research and engineering and are glad to share this with our team of organizers from universities around the country and hopefully next year around the world. So we will uh, hand it over to Cami to give us our welcome. First, I'd like to show you our uh, a bio of Cami. I know she has some other things to do today, so I don't want to keep her, but just to mention that she is the Dean of the Herbert Wortham College of Engineering and also a professor of material science and engineering. Her research interests are in synthesis of thin film electronic materials and devices using metal, metal organic chemical vapor deposition and molecular beam epitaxy. Um, she has many accolades, uh, being a fellow of the American Physics Society, MRS, AAAS, ABS, and Electromechanical Society, and the director of the American Society of Engineering Education, Engineering Dean's Council Executive Board. So please take it away, Cami. Thank you, Janice. It's, I'm delighted to welcome you all to the second annual Women in IoT Workshop. It really is a pleasure to, uh, to be associated with this event. Uh, I was telling someone earlier, the Nelms Institute is one of the crown jewels of the college. It was created by David Nelms in honor of his father, who was quite the tinkerer, Warren B. Nelms, and helped David to understand, first and foremost, how important uh, technologies like Internet of Things are to the future of society. It's also important that we continue to diversify the engineering workforce. There's a critical need for women and people of color in the uh, technology workforce and in the technology field if we're actually going to be able to recruit enough talent to fill all the jobs in this area and also to come up with the kind of breakthrough innovations we need to have a more diverse workforce. So this workshop actually achieves mo both of those objectives quite effectively. Janice mentioned that we have been recently named top five among public institutions in the country. Much of this, uh, the university's rise in stature has come about because of the great faculty that we've hired over the last a decade or so, uh, and the accomplish their accomplishments in fields like IoT and artificial intelligence. AI has taken on a particular emphasis over the last several years. It has become a campus-wide initiative. Uh, it is driven by the provost and also by a number of our external stakeholders, most notably Chris Malachowski, one of the co-founders of NVIDIA, who along with NVIDIA recently uh, gave the university one of the largest uh, GPU supercomputers in academia, academia in, the, in the country. So we are very well positioned to assume a leadership role and also to incorporate AI across all the disciplines. Obviously, it's important in engineering and computer science, but it's also important in agriculture, healthcare, et cetera. So there is a huge demand for uh, AI-enabled workforce. And again, I think workshops like this one help us to uh, continue to attract talent to this field and to show people what kind of careers you can have in a field like IoT and AI. It's true that the university has uh, aspirations to be one of the leaders in AI in the country, but it's also our aspiration to help uh, the entire country and the, and the state of Florida become more AI prepared as well. So again, thank you to the organizers of this workshop. Uh, very proud of their accomplishments. Me, Janice, all the faculty who worked on this, thank you so much. I look forward to uh, seeing next year's as well, and hopefully this will become a tradition and you'll all be able to continue to join us uh, each year as we celebrate and and encourage more women to pursue careers in Internet of Things and AI. So thank you again. Thank you for your participation. And with that, I will turn it back over to Janice and me. 
Great, thank you, Cami. We appreciate you uh, stopping by at the beginning to give us our welcome. And now I will go over a few things like the uh, agenda for the day, and then also how you can get to different uh, locations. Our workshop organizing committee consists of uh, six women who are also um, emerging or uh, established researchers in these areas we're talking about today. Uh, myself, Mitai Dalma Turgut, and Tempest Neal are from universities around Florida and have uh, gathered last year to put on the first um, workshop. We came back this year to do it again, so we really enjoy uh, putting this together for you. And this year, joining us new are Wenye Wang from North Carolina State University and Yanning Shen from University of California, Irvine. They're new to our team and they've been helping us as well this year. We do uh, want to acknowledge our student poster technical program committee that was put together by Tempest Neal and Yanning Shen, who helped us uh, read the poster abstracts, evaluate them and uh, decide who was going to present today. And our Nelms Institute, of course, we want to acknowledge the Institute itself. Um, as Cami talked about, and our director of the Institute, Swar Bunia, uh, who is part of the steering committee of this workshop and has been very encouraging and helpful for us in putting us together as well as uh, Mitai again as the associate director of the center and our research coordinator, Lauren Stickland, who has helped us a lot with the website and administrative uh, tasks putting this together. So without our team, this would not be able to happen and happen so well. Now the links for the workshop, keep in mind that there are three different links. For the first part of the workshop, we'll have our webinar with our speakers and panels. So that's the first uh, link you see up here with tiny URL and uh, with WIT 2021 speakers. Stay on this link for this uh, afternoon between 1 p.m. and 3.30 p.m. UTC minus four time. Next, we will go to uh, a more interactive session where people can uh, meet other researchers with similar interests, where they can uh, learn more about job um, hunting or about building their research lab or about getting tenure. We have a number of different sessions based on what the people who registered chose as their most uh, pressing interest. So you can do that in the afternoon between 3.30, uh, 3.35 and five. There's also a student posters uh, session right after the collaboration session. So use that same uh, tiny URL, URL link to access the student posters during that session. Please make sure you have Zoom version 5.3.0 or later, because that's the only way you'll be able to move between the various breakout rooms. Um, so just update your Zoom between uh, the, if you haven't already, between the 3.30 session and the, the later in the afternoon session, please update your Zoom so you can move between the breakout sessions and see the different posters and collaborations. There is also a Slack channel to allow people to collaborate even further, to ask questions and build connections, here is the URL for that. Um, there's a URL to view the student posters. You can see uh, a shorter version of their poster by video and see what the topics are and who you might want to zoom in person to view today. And then the final link is the uh, agenda for the whole workshop. It's at the same uh, website where you registered or found out other information. So if anyone's looking for these links, you can send it to them or you can go to the main website and you'll see the links there. So the workshop agenda today, we're going to have a welcome. And um, we already had our welcome by Cami. We're going to have our keynote um, with Sujata at 1.15. We'll have our government and industry panel at 1.50. We'll take a break between 2.35 and 2.45. Then we'll have our university related panel. We also have an NSF uh, program manager there, so it's not all university, but it's related to university research. And then we'll transition to our later collaboration and student poster sessions uh, in the afternoon between 3.35 and 5 p.m. UTC minus four. So now we will hand uh, our, our uh, speaker box over to Dr. Mitai, who will talk a little bit more about the NELM Center and introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Uh, let me share the screen here.
So now you can see my entire lot, uh, desktop, right? All right, thank you again, Janice. Uh, so uh, uh, before we officially start the workshop, I would like to uh, briefly highlight the name Institute. Um, as the Dean already mentioned, so our name Institute at the University of Florida was uh, created a couple of years back uh, with a very generous gift uh, from Mr. De uh, David Nems, an American businessman and the former CEO of Discover Financial, to honor his father, who was an IoT pioneer in a very early age. So with such a passion on IoT, our mission is to develop foundational IoT technology for solving global problems. So since then, we have rapidly grown into more than 60 faculty members with many exciting activities, uh, including all three fronts of research, education and outreach. What makes us different is that at our institute, we provide well-rounded training with emphasis on the hand-on learning, and we also provide a very strong platform for interdisciplinary research focus on the connected world, the innovation in the core IoT technology at all layers and its application, right? And with the theme this year, we focus more into uh, AI and IoT. And uh, so uh, our institute fosters a strong agency and industry connection and collaboration. Uh, so here you can see some of the logo here. And we also actively engage in more company as well. So hopefully next year when we come back, you can see more logo on this uh, slide. And now come to moment that many of the attendees waiting for, right? The first uh, one, that is the keynote. So it is my honor to introduce to you all our keynote speaker today, Dr. Suchata Benerjee a senior director of research at VMware. So she has a very long and successful profile of which I will briefly highlight a few items only, right? So first of all, Dr. Benerjee's lead research activities in the area of distributed system, networking and machine learning at VMware. She holds over 40 U.S. patent and is a recipient of the U.S. National Science Foundation Career Award in Networking Research. And uh, Dr. Benerjee served as the Technical Program Co-Chair of the ACM SICCOM 2020 Unis UCNIX and SDR 2018 conferences, just to name a few. So all of the, this conference are very well known and first rank conference in the field. Uh, she is also a member of CC C Council, a member of CRA, and is on the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Fabric Programmable Research Infrastructure. In 2020, and she served in the AI Working Group of the FCC Technology Advisory Council. And let me give a little bit of history here. So prior to VMware, she was a director at Distinguished Technologies at Hewlett Packard. Before her industrial research career, she held a tenure associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh. And Dr. Benerjee received the, her PhD degree from the University of Southern California and the BTEC and MTech degrees from the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. So today, Dr. Benerjee will talk about the smart, safe, sustainable IoT system and what are the challenges and the future. So with that, let us welcome Dr. Benerjee. Thank you so much, me. Um, and thanks to all of the organizers. Let me just get my slide up. Um, so when we're waiting for her slide to be up, I would like to let you know that we have the Q&A question at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to uh, tap any question you have along her presentation. And at the end of the presentation, I will read the question and then she will respond. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much again, uh, Professor Tai um, and all of the organizing committee members to invite me to this um, really exciting forum. And um, it's, it's really great to see how your institute has grown. And it's my privilege to be able to talk to you today. So I'm going to talk about um, smart, safe, and sustainable. IoT systems and touch upon a number of topics that um, Dean Abernathy talked about as well. I wanted to start the talk with, um, 
with my own research background, like many of you, um, I, my networking, my research background is in networking, and this has been my journey as the network transformations have happened over the last 10, 15 years. And we started out with, you know, making the systems more programmable, um, on to making it, you know, making automation of various functions possible. And then now we are all riding the wave of um, machine learning and AI, which is enabling us to get to that next level of, you know, smartening up the control systems and go towards autonomic systems. So that's where sort of my journey has been. And um, I, I won't be surprised if many of you have, you know, in your own disciplines have uh, gone through a similar journey where we are looking very closely at how AI and ML technologies impact our um, environments, including IoT. So today I'm going to be talking about um, those intersection points. And in, in some sense, um, you know, I should be clear that I'm not an ML or AI researcher. I am a, an ML or ML and AI enthusiast. And I'm looking for opportunities to bring multidisciplinary research approaches together, which I think is really important in this particular area. So I start a lot of my talks with looking at sort of emerging trends. And, you know, clearly we're all here because of IoT and edge computing, which is really changing the way we operate in many different sectors. I'll go over a few of the different sectors that um, are getting directly impacted, you know, whether it's manufacturing, healthcare, and so on. And the interesting thing about the space is, um, unlike prior, you know, revolutions, much of the data and computation, uh, well, much of the data is, is being born at the edge, and it's staying at the edge, causing the computation to move closer to them, and, um, you know, is, is changing a number of ways in which we can apply different uh, techniques to, to solve really important societal problems. There are, you know, tremendous amounts of change in how the computing paradigms themselves are evolving, um, you know, function as a service, granular computing methods are things, again, which really impact how we build applications at the edge. So I'll mention that as another trend. There's um, lots of new hardware um, advances, including accelerators, which enable us to do computation. Um, and this is not, um, the hardware is also impacting new kinds of sensors, which is again, fueling the IoT um, revolution. And many of these accelerators are, um, help us do more computations fast, which again ends up um, helping with the um, uh, machine learning analytics, um, that uh, is, is another trend. Next generation wireless, um, fast, high bandwidth, low latency environments, um, which um, again, um, enable us to connect the edge to the core in um, you know, interesting ways and fast ways. So you can get some real time applications working like never before. And these new real time applications are in the domain of you know, automotives, uh, you know, self-driving uh, cars, for example, but also um, you know, virtual reality, um, XR applications, extended reality kinds of applications, which are becoming much more important. And then finally, the topic of AI and machine learning, this has really been pervasive across many different disciplines. And we are all taking a new look at how we build compelling applications um, with all of these trends in mind. And, um, machine learning and AI techniques are at the heart of making a lot of these things go from the automation step to the autonomic step. So with that, um, I'll jump in. Um, and by, oh, by the way, um, me, I'm not looking at um, the chat at this point in time. So um, yes, no, no worries, yeah. yeah, at the end of your talk, then we can stop answer. Okay, how yes. do I get rid of this chat now? Are you seeing the chat window that I just opened up? Uh, no, we just see your slide only. 
Okay, so for some reason, I'm unable to get rid of the, the chat window. Just press the chat button again. That's what I did. But then hit the X on the side. Yeah. yeah, the X is unfortunately, just give me one second, I'll stop sharing and I'll come right back. Okay. Okay. Hopefully we are back. So, um, with, um, so there are many emerging societal needs which are driving this, this revolution. And many of these are things that you've, you've looked at in your own um, sort of you know, own work. And whether it's media and entertainment, digital healthcare, smart manufacturing, precision manufacturing, agriculture advances, safety and emergency applications and retail applications. And all of these things basically have um, some kind of remote collaboration opportunity. And I will highlight the one on the, on the right bottom, which is the hybrid work life um, related applications, including this particular session that we are in right now, which is you know, I, I, we are all in remote locations. We are coming together to mm -hmm. to discuss an important topic, and as we think about how do we improve this environment, um, you know, the pandemic was, you know, um, what was was basically something that propelled us into thinking about these aspects much more. So, in you know, especially this, to the students who are in the audience, think about how you can improve the whole um, area of interactive collaboration, telepresence, and what do hybrid environments look like in the future? These are some of the important topics that I think are worth seeing. And this is where IoT and AI will come together in some interesting ways to provide sort of the next generation collaboration platforms. And one of the themes that you'll see throughout this talk is that you need multidisciplinary um, interactions for this future to come through. So it's it's not just about computing, it's about social aspects, it's about sustainability, um, it's, it's about um, how um, different areas of computing, whether it's robotics, for example, or networking, these things have to come together to solve, uh, you know, solve the big problem at hand. And so, so think about multidisciplinary interactions as you, as you do your own work. So I've taken this slide from oh. Professor Elisa Bertino with whom I, I wrote a, a short white paper um, from the CCC um, uh, as part of, his, of our CCC activities. And this, this slide gives you a picture of how IoT and AI techniques come together to really provide some next generation features in health security. We're all in this pandemic environment still. And by the way, I didn't start this talk with that, but I hope all of your loved ones and all of you are doing well. Uh, it's, it's really a, a difficult situation that is still playing out. But think about all of these different capabilities of being able to combat the pandemic by looking at the data that we are collecting in the environment through IoT sensors, perhaps, and managing and tracking how people interact and how we enforce some of the things that the pandemic has put on us, like safe distancing, for example. Can you take health um, monitoring, um, you know, can you do health monitoring that helps you, um, you know, say whether it's temperature scanning or anything else? To, to make sure that we're all being safe um, and we're able to manage this um, with, with um, the new systems that are coming up. Another um, set of work is, uh, which is really important and plays to almost all of the fields on all of the use case areas that I mentioned with agriculture, healthcare, factory automation, and so on, are the advances in robotics and AI coming together. And I've, I've, I've quoted Professor Ken Goldberg here, who's been working on something called fog robotics, um, which basically tries to build the next generation of robotic systems applied to say manufacturing um, and you know, agriculture. And 
it's all about bringing the computation between basically what's at the edge of the network, the devices themselves, the robots and the factory floor, um, you know, um, whatever equipment you may be using, and how to effectively take the computation that is needed, the resources that you have, and really form um, the uh, take the right decisions in distributing the compute and the communication in a way that you achieve your real time requirements. So very, very interesting areas to, to consider. So let me sort of step back for a second and say, what is the edge? And it is actually, even after a, quite a bit of time, we don't have a very crisp definition. Um, you know, the edge has been defined in, in many ways. So in, in terms of the latency between, so there's a far edge, the near edge, you know, which may be a millisecond to 10 milliseconds apart. Um, there could be, you know, um, the, the, the edge to me is, is pretty blurry. And maybe for this discussion, at least, let's not uh, pay too much attention on where the edge is, but think about an edge infrastructure that goes all the way from sensors and devices, all the way into the, um, you know, the core of, of computation, which might be in private, public, hybrid, multi-cloud environments. One of the interesting things about the edge, though, is that there are a number of different factors. So, if you look at the, um, the, the text on the top, which talks about, you know, it's multi-star bunch of things, right? So multi-tenant, multi-stakeholder, multi-vendor, uh, multi-applications, and then handling multimodal data. And all of these things taken together form a very interesting ecosystem that spans basically from the device all the way to the cloud. And all of these are being fueled. I talked about it a little bit already. Exponential growth in, excuse me, exponential growth in devices and users. Um, there is tremendous amount of data that is being born at the edge and cannot really leave the edge because of maybe resource constraints. So there's, um, you know, bandwidth constraints at the edge, so you can't really move it. There could be data security and privacy considerations. So some of the data might be really sensitive from a personal standpoint, from a business standpoint. And we're looking at new latency sensitive applications, which means that a lot of the computation really must move closer to the edge. And another, um, concern is how do you make it easy for a new application developer to you know produce an application on the edge so currently there is a high barrier to entry for new applications a lot of the infrastructure applications all of the stakeholders and vendors many things we are building in a siloed manner and so breaking apart those silos to be able to make it easy for new applications to come, that will be actually really, really important as we think about all of the societal needs that are coming to, to bear. And another interesting point is that the edge is not one thing, it's a distributed edge. And um, you might have, think about a retail store, think about, you know, which has many different branches, think about a hospital, which has many different locations. And there might be needs to have analytic models um, that you build across a particular entity, but you can't move the data. So privacy preserving computations and uh, analytics will become extremely important. So this is, you know, a rough picture of the edge, a high level abstraction, if you will. And what um, uh, Professor Bertino and I actually wrote this white paper, it's, you know, we are not the only ones. There are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work in this space already. And we bucketed the, um, the opportunities and challenges in many different areas. So we have, you know, um, eight areas over here. And um, I think I've already talked about some of it with the analytics at the edge opportunity. And it's not just about running um, AI workloads at the edge for a particular application, but you might be using 
the same kind of analytics and machine learning to manage the edge infrastructure. I was talking about how you might want to move computation across the entire ecosystem from the device to edge to cloud. And that's where you know, some of the optimizations that you might want to make might be through some machine learning um, uh, techniques to, to analyze the data that you're seeing from the infrastructure and the applications and do it in a very optimized way. A lot of um, these applications are, and the environment itself is extremely dynamic. And so we need to be you know, producing techniques which are adaptive and context sensitive. So it's not that you can apply the same kind of optimization every time. You really need to understand what the specific context is. How do we make decisions in real time? And some of the inferencing techniques, um, machine learning based inferencing techniques need to have that capability to give you, you know, decisions which are split second decisions, you know, so you can make sure that the, the robot that you're operating on the factory floor doesn't really, you know, go off balance, for example, it must get the right amount, right decision making in the, in the time that you've got. I alluded to the fact that data is distributed, but it may not be shareable. And so there are new federated learning approaches that uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, towards the end of the, uh, in a few minutes about how these federated learning um, techniques are extremely important where you don't, you share the, the parameters of the model, but you're not sharing the data. And then the three, Things that are left are basically the topics that I will cover a little bit. So resource efficiency is extremely important. Resource efficiency automatically doesn't mean sustainability. Sustainability is a much bigger topic than that. But resource efficiency, I think, is something that is very important, a step towards sustainability. We've all heard about how the models are getting really big. They need tremendous amounts of data to get the accuracies that you need. And we should all be working on data distillation techniques and model distillation techniques and being very efficient in how we run these workloads. Along with that, and I purposely pulled these apart, there's resource efficient AI, but there's also resource constrained AI and the edge could be one of those particularly constrained places. So think about the edge being a base station or the edge being, you know, a retail store, which has maybe just a few computers, maybe half a rack of computers that it can use, maybe some scattered set of accelerators, very heterogeneous. And under those conditions, you still want your analytics to be sound and accurate. And so um, resources, so we have all got to learn how to build models that really work in a resource constrained environment. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then finally, I, we have great promise in these techniques. Um, you know, deep neural nets have shown uh, tremendous value in, in many different areas and use cases. But one of the things that we need to think about very hard is safety of these systems. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, what I mean by that and the, the work that we have been doing in, um, in, in our uh, research group uh, on that particular topic. Okay, so uh, hopefully I have, you know, some of the background context and, you know, research issues uh, at least highlighted at um, a high level. The rest of the talk, I, I want to focus on resource efficiency and safety of these systems um, with, with the goal that, you know, some of the resource efficiency will bring sustainable principles in, in how we build these systems out. And then, um, there's, there's already been a lot of research in, in this space, and one thing that I'm particularly happy about and, uh, is that we've, we've had uh, from VMware um, a number of partnerships with the National Science Foundation, and we have a number of these. Uh, hopefully, some of you applied to the RINGS program, uh, which came out earlier this year. But as you go from the security to edge computing to sustainable digital infrastructure and resilient intelligent next G systems, 
IoT and AI have been increasing as trends as we go from you know the left to the right, and this is something that is. Uh, particularly um, exciting to me personally that there's all this um, uh, all, all this uh, these initiatives to to really work on these very exciting and challenging research topics. So I'm going to sort of pivot a little bit and talk about some of the work that um, our group has been doing um, in, in uh, VMware on these different topics and of course, there's a lot of work out there. Uh, I'm just going to use some of these as example topics, which hopefully will give you a flavor of the kinds of research problems that we are tackling in this particular uh, area. So let me start with the, the sustainable AI at the edge uh, issue. And um, I alluded to the fact that the carbon footprint of machine learning operations is growing. And this is both on the side of you know, the computation and the data infrastructure, and it's for both training and influence. So we really should be thinking about the economics of machine learning ops in a holistic way, measuring and, and analyzing the costs and considering the trade-offs. Um, oftentimes, the, the sort of the main goal is let's get very high accuracy, which is really important. But the accuracy at what cost, I think, is something that we should really be thinking about. Uh, models like GPT-3, for example, are really amazing breakthroughs. But the cost of actually training that model, the cost of you know, using that model is something that we should consider. In, and especially at the edge, it becomes even more important because of the resource constraints that we already have. And then one of the other aspects, and I know, you know it's, it's not lost on this particular um, group of people in the audience, but ML is driven by data. And there is a lot of sort of work that needs to be done with the data, whether it's not only collecting, storing, cleaning, labeling the data, um, they all have tremendous amounts of cost. And so we need to be able to really understand whether supervised learning is the right way to go. Should we be focusing more on unsupervised, you know, in order to reduce the labeling costs, for example. And you've all seen this this um, graphic that came out uh, from Google a while ago, and really the algorithmic portion of the ML or the ML an analysis itself is, is a small part of the entire ecosystem of the kinds of things that you need to do for the data. And those are costs that need to be thought through again at the edge. It's, it's more important because we have you know, limited amount of, of resources. So some of the emerging approaches um, you know, with respect to reducing this burden is of course, you know, come up with algorithms that are more resource efficient, go towards unsupervised algorithms, come up with different model and data distillation approaches. And the other thing is integrating existing knowledge often called augmented AI. And I have a reference at the bottom, which might be, uh, useful, which is another white paper that came out of the CCC on this, where your models may not have to learn everything from data. Some things may be, you know, already known from, say, the physics of the operation that you're doing. And so how do we integrate existing knowledge, maybe queuing theory kinds of things. So you don't have to learn everything from the data, which hopefully will reduce the overall cost of building the model. And then, of course, running machine learning on low power components rather than often you know, going straight to the, the most um, powerful, um, whether it's CPUs or GPUs, um, which may consume more power. So how do we operate on low power components? And so here's an example, and you should just think of this as an example um, case, which was done by um, a bunch of researchers who have list, I've listed uh, up here, some VMware and also with our academic uh, collaborators. And here's an idea of breaking apart a problem. So rather than taking the entire data set and coming up with a huge model that needs to look at, um, it tries to come up with the highest accuracy, um, but uses the entire data set, it's kind of difficult 
uh, to limit the resource usage. And so here's an idea to break up the problem into, you know, build a simple model which does the easy queries really well. And this is in the context of decision trees. And so you, you take that and you handle the easy queries and then you build expert models which try to work on the harder queries but are trained only on a fraction of the data set. And you know, I'm, I'm giving you a very high level approach. There was a paper that came out recently on this in this month, in fact. And just breaking down this problem in this um, way, you can, um, you know, the research has shown that you can really, you know, reduce the training time, reduce the memory footprint, and increase, I mean, and uh, decrease the classification time um, for uh, many different problems with uh, many different data sets. So this is an this is the kind of approach, again, not the only approach, but kind of approach that we should be thinking about at the edge. Um, and you can take this idea to a federated learning based mechanism where um, you're now actually having to, you're operating at the edge, you know, you have only some amount of data set at each of these nodes and you're exchanging global parameters uh, to build a you know, sort of a, a global model. And you can take that idea with the uh, resource efficient mechanism to now have a system where you're building a primary model and a secondary model, and you end up exchanging a lot less information in terms of even the parameter exchanges. So um, these may be some ways to actually go forward and build resource efficient systems at the edge. Me, how much time do I have? I think you can have until 45. Okay, thank you. So five minutes more? Yes. Okay, perfect. I think I'll, I'll make it. So the other topic that I wanted to talk to you about was, you know, safe AI and safe AI has uh, received a lot of attention already. So it's not um, the first topic in, in the context of the edge, but in the context of the edge, it gets more interesting in some ways because a lot of the systems we are deploying are cyber physical systems and cyber physical systems basically bridge the physical and the digital world. And it could have real impact, real safety concerns and you can think about these as, you know, self-driving cars, of course, but, you know, again, sort of manufacturing equipment and things like that. So you're trying to get to autonomic control and actuation. A lot of these systems end up using reinforcement learning controllers. It's basically a control loop and the control loop looks something like this, um, which you already had. But now your controller has a key piece in there, which is a neural network. And so how do you, you know, make sure that the neural network is operating correctly? I think that's the, the piece that I want to talk a little bit about. And it won't, it may not often be just a single control loop. It may be multiple control loops and they're all working autonomically. They're all learning from the environment, taking different data sets. And how do they interact with each other? And how do they interact with each other in a safe way? Is I think the other topic that really needs to be thought through. Um, I was I was lucky enough to be part of this particular group that um, uh, worked with uh, within uh, worked as a um, sort of AI working group for the FCC and came up with a number of characteristics of safe AI ML. And so these are topics that you know I don't have time to go through in great detail, but fairness, transparency, you know, how do you save yourself from adversarial attack? How do you account and explain, uh, account for and explain what is happening with the particular AI application? And is it robust? Robustness is extremely important. And so many of these things are coming together in research questions such as, the, the basic question is, is the controller operating correctly? And here's a graphic of something that has been looked at and you know, it showed up in this paper a long time ago where you have the stop sign on the left and with some you know little stickies that you stick on the stop sign the um, the analytic program interprets it as a speed limit you know exactly the opposite of what it should be doing and so imagine you know using that 
wrong information in, in the real world, which could cause some uh, pretty bad um, sort of output, cause some really bad outcomes. So these are the kind of questions we're asking. You know, does the controller behave as expected? Is it fair? And, you know, maybe you can answer by saying you're trying to verify a property and you say, no, here's a state that doesn't. So it tells you a little bit about whether your controller is operating correctly. Can you explain the decisions the controller is taking? So how do specific state features influence the decision? And here's a list of features that determine the decision. That would help us understand. And then robustness, you know, is the controller robust to changes? And if the you know, the answer is, hey, no, you know, small changes in input lead to large variable changes in the outputs so it could get the whole controller to be unstable, for example. And here I want to point out to this graphic on the right, which is recent work that is trying to take, you know, build formal models of the, of the neural net in a way that you can ask these questions and you say, you know, I'm perturbing the input you know, how much is the output getting perturbed by? Is the perturbation in the output causing the system to go outside the operating range, which is safe? And of course, those questions, you know, you need to be able to get from the domain experts who say, yes, this is, you know, the safe range, and this is the safe set of inputs that you can perhaps do. But there are now formal methods that you can actually, um, to uh, actually answer these questions with some guarantees. And then I'll, I'll stop in, in just a minute, but here's another piece of work um, which touches upon the edge. So there has been work uh, out of our group which can now verify binarized neural networks really well. And by, you know, VNNs are basically, you know, class of neural networks where most of the parameters are binary. And the reason why I also bring this up in this particular context is that BNNs could be actually, they, they're smaller models, they're you know, faster to compute models, and these have good applications at the edge. So um, I will you know, get to the end, and uh, I think the conclusions are not um, you know, groundbreaking conclusions. I think I just want to say there are many, many exciting research opportunities. I, I wish you all good luck in picking some of these topics and thinking holistically about the problem and exploring trade-offs. And then finally, the thing that I've already hopped on a little bit is uh, multidisciplinary efforts, I think, you know, is, is really important to, to get the big wins here. So with that, I'll stop and like I can take some questions. I'm sorry if I ran a little bit long. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Benerji, for a very inspiring talk. And now we have a couple of questions, I mean, a couple of minutes for a couple of questions here. So first, let me uh, look at the Q&A question. And uh, OK, so here uh, from have a question. The safe AI is interesting. How mature this direction is today? Could you please recommend some system or method related to this direction? This is a great question. And I think the, the fact that, I mean, this is not, a, not something that's coming up only in the context of edge. I think there's been a lot of work in trying to take, um, to, to build basically um, explainable AI or interpretable AI systems. And um, this may be something that I can uh, connect you to, to people working on this topic within our team um, and give you more sort of, you know, uh, explicit pointers here. But it is, it's, it's not, um, it's, it's a topic of great interest, but there's a lot of work left to be done. So I think some of the earliest work in this space, um, which, which basically used linear inter interpolation type th uh, techniques, used, um, it came up with systems such as, you know, uh, something called LIME, which was trying to basically explain um, the, the model itself. And I think we have to go much further in this space. And the one technique that I, um, or at least I showed you a, a series of questions that we are asking, and we're trying to build systems for ex answering exactly those questions. So I think a lot more work needs to be done before I can say, yes, these are, the problem is solved. We are not close to it yet. All right, thank you. Okay, I see another question coming up here. Why should safe AI 
and like topic be addressed at the edge rather than in the context AI prevails in the most? So um, this is also a great question. Uh, th thanks, Stephen, for, for bringing it up. I'm, I'm actually not saying that this is a topic that needs to be only addressed at the edge. I think it needs to be addressed in all domains that AI is being applied in. Um, the reason why at the edge it becomes a little bit more, um, it, it has sort of maybe, you know, more challenges in some ways is for the two reasons. One is that we are likely to be applying these techniques in cyber physical systems. So you, you have some safety constraints, you know, you, you don't want to be harming, say, a human who's, who's operating a piece of machinery, for example. Um, but also the fact that the at the edge, you have some constraints that you need to you need to sort of work with. So, for example, if I distill the model down, does the accuracy decrease? Does if the accuracy decreases, does it cause more safety issues? So, you know, it's it's. Um, I'm not saying that it's more important at the edge, but it's something that causes us to uh, think about slightly different uh, issues than what we would have seen it in maybe, you know, um, uh, coming up with unbiased AI methods in some other use case. Anything else? It, okay. Uh, we also have another 15 minute break right after the panel. So if anyone have more questions at that time, we can address more questions. Now, let me ask you one question, Jata. All right, so we all know AI prone to attack security and, uh, and also need to be more explainable, more responsible, more fairness. We have many, like AI need to carry many more missions, right? But what IoT bring, what unique perspective that IoT bring into AI? In general, we require a lot for AI, but I just want to know from your point of view, what specific thing that IoT and post AI need to have? So um, I can think of this question in, in, in both ways. So what IoT brings to AI and what AI brings to IoT. And I, th I think that um, these are sort of complementary techniques, if you will, right? Uh, do all IoT systems have to have, you know, AI um, techniques inbuilt into them? Probably not, but um, it's an opportunity, right? It's an, it's an opportunity. Um, in, in some cases, as we go towards more automated systems, we don't have any other choice but to bring advanced analytics and mm -hmm. constant sensing because we won't be able to get the kind of results that we we want to achieve by just say you know simple rule based systems you know it needs to be a continuous learning kind of an environment but i think my message is you know it's very exciting there are many possibilities let's make sure that we examine the the whole space in a holistic manner and examine the trade offs so i think that's just the message. I feel like these are very sort of complementary, very um, exciting possibilities to bring them together. Agree, and a long way to go for this merit. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I, I think uh, it's time for us to switch to the panel. Uh, so thank you very much again, Dr. Benji, for your talk, very inspiring talk. And then some audience also asked for the slides. Maybe we can share it later, if possible. Yeah. Thank All you right. very much for inviting me. Thank you.